Good afternoon from uh, Amma Tsutina. And what I said is my name is Spotted Eagle. And uh, I'm a teacher. And right now I'm teaching a university level course on the Tsutina Reserve. I started the Certain uh, Language Institute back in 2008. And we've been at it 10 years, and there hasn't been so much Certain spoken in our community as there is today. And when I started the program, I intentionally did not hire speakers to teach the language. Why? Because some of them refused to read and write certain. In my late 40s, my original dream was to be a veterinarian. I had the marks. I was an honor student in junior high, and I had good marks in uh, senior high. So I had the uh, capacity to be what I wanted to be. But my dad died, and then uh, there was nobody to look after my, my mom and my brothers and sisters. So I had to set it aside because my older siblings just buried and moved away. So me and my sister, we set about looking after our family. <clears throat> and I did everything, you know, logging. Uh, raising cattle, just to keep the family going together. And uh, so I hope I succeeded in that part of my life. So in my late 40s, I went back to school because there was linguists all over the place trying to tell me, this is how your language works, this is how your language functions. So I went back to university, and uh, all I found was the linguists were just touching the surface of our language. Like if there, you see linguists in your community, you need to sit down with them and say, our language is holy, because their language is no longer holy. They think all languages are like English now. So there's one thing that I found that was different. And uh, so what I learned, my last year was in, uh, uh, in the University of uh, Fairbanks in Alaska. And I had some uh, real good teachers there. But they're, uh, of course, of the old school because they're older. And there was no one flexible enough to listen to a certain speaker explain words to them. Until I had a student, uh, his name is uh, Christopher Cox. He's from, uh, he was from Edmonton and he moved to, no, he was from Saskatchewan, moved to Alberta. Now he's at the Carleton University. He was my student, 
and he was the first ever linguist to receive an order of Canada. So I had something to do with his success in attaining that part part of his of his uh, award. So he started working with us. And then uh, instead of going to the University of Calgary, I went to the University of Alberta and I started working with them because they were willing to listen and work with with me and with the Tsurkina. The other uh, professors, doctors, who worked on our languages always had a view. You know, I know what I'm doing. You know, you're just a speaker. Well, one time in a conference such as this, this old man stood up and said, I'm the expert here, not you. You listen to what I have to say. So from that time, you know, we're the experts, the speakers. And uh, so it was like a, an awakening for me. And that gave me the, how you say, that gave me uh, more energy to, to say that we're, we the speakers of any languages, indigenous language, are the experts, not the white men. One time we had a conference in uh, Toronto. It was in the winter time. It was cold. But it was on Dene languages. And, uh, and myself and this guy, he's a linguist, uh, Dr. Nicholas Welch, we put the program together. And what we wanted was for the linguist to tell us, you know, what what is happening in linguistic terms? What is happening within the paradigm of the Dene, of the, in the Dene languages? None of them would touch it. They talked about something else because they didn't know. So the main objective of the workshop was missed. Even though we brought people from Navajo and other Dene communities, so, if you're a speaker, you're the expert, not them. And you're the professors, you're the doctors. In my community, they, they have made me speak, these ladies. This is my adopted sister and my niece. They made me speak ahead of them, so I'm going to take all the whole time. <laughs> so anyway, um, so uh, we were uh, in the, in in Sudan. Like I said, I intentionally did not hire speakers to teach Sudan. I hired non-speakers. Didn't know a damn word in Sudan. The objective was that the teacher and the child would learn at the same speed, at the same level. Then we had mentors in the classroom, elders that corrected the language. And then it was working. Then all of a sudden, you know all these know-it-alls, they start dismantling it. So right now we're three years behind. I do not believe in immersion all by itself, got to tell you that. You have to read and write your language. You, it's, a, it's a must. You know why? I don't know how long I'm going to live. Maybe five years. I'm hoping maybe another 18 years. I don't know. Reality is, if we don't write it down, if we don't record it, and we don't read it, then we have, we didn't leave anything with our children. So it's important that 
Immersion, reading and writing goes together. That's how I learned English. I didn't go to residential school. I went to day school. And I, I got the, I was able to go home and be immersed in my language. And so the idea was, okay, so they beat the hell out of our, the ones that went to residential school and day school to not, for us not to speak our language. So rather than do that, we'll teach the way it's supposed to be taught with kindness. And that's the elder mentor in the classroom. Because, like I said, it's, I tell the people at home, there's only 18 of us mobile enough to actually help with the language. So with that kind of a number, we need to, with, with that kind of a number, we need to read and write and record. So that's our problem. And right now, as, as I'm speaking, from this morning, I've been translating, transcribing, and interpreting into Tsukina. There's some requests from home. So my job is 24-7. And uh, so I, I, I just work because what else can I do? Can't chase girls anymore. So I just work. So I put all my life into what, you know, what's left of my life, I put into my work. So that's what has to be done. But these young people, they punch in at eight, they punch out at four, and they're gone. Those of us that are speakers know that that language doesn't doesn't last from eight to four. It's it's twenty four seven. So, like I said, you know the but. Our little kids, my granddaughter is four years old, is starting to speak to it in the, and at the concert times they sing the Christmas carols and so I write I write it out for them. And we have a white woman teaching to it in the, She's learning the language. One of the wives of our one of our council members. But what has to happen? Uh, Pat and I were talking about politics last night about council. Council. It has. We as speakers, we have to tell them. There should be either all Blackfoot, all Stony speaking people in council, or a selected number of seats set aside for speaking our languages. The speakers have to be part of our politics. I tell the council, when they come to me for advice, I tell them, why do you try and talk white man. I said, you don't even know what the meaning of anti-disestablishmentarianism is. What are, why, are you trying to, why are you trying to talk like them? I said, you know why they're always beating us? I said, because you're trying to act and talk like them. I told them, act sort in the, talk sort in the English, you'll always win. But you act like them, you know, you'll end up being like them or they're going to beat you. Our languages are powerful. We had a Dene conference two, two weeks ago. We had over 500 delegates. We expected 200 to 250, but there was Dene. And there was all Dene people. 
and it was so amazing. So they danced and they sang. I just let them go. We got more out of the song and dance than speaking like this. I, I, I don't go much to conferences because we don't go home and say, this is what we learned and this is how we can help our speakers. What we should do from here, because now our languages are law, we should come up with a declaration from all the tribes. And we need to work together, like they do in BC, because they got good funding, because they all work together. Not to tell the Crees how to talk Cree, not to tell the Blackfoot this is the way you say things, just to share what is working and not working. So my white friend here, he's keep going like they got no more time. <laughs> so like last night, he was just looking out like this, hey. I told him, Bob, I said, quit worrying, I said, or else we'll all get drunk on you. <laughs> Okay, this is what I want to say. I want to say that 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 I am um, happy to be here to represent uh, Six Gates Deppi um, to share with you um, basically kind of the progress that we have been making. I'm glad that Bikami showed up here. They uh, are part of Six Gates Deppi. Um, so I just have a, a short little PowerPoint here. So Six Gates Deppi, uh, we have been um, well, keepers of our language, and I have to really thank our chiefs, Roy Fox, Stan Greer, um, Weasel Child, the gangster, no. Joe Weasel Child, and um, on the U.S. side, uh, Tim, no, not Jim. Anyway, he was only acting. But anyways, on the U.S. side, our counterpart, um, Tim, I can't remember his last name, sorry. But anyways, uh, and the efforts of our, right here, these are people from Six Gates to be, that have really been uh, working um, to try and re revitalize and keep our language going. It, it hasn't died, but we really need to work hard to pick it up and make it strong again. I've been uh, on the education board, and so I've had a chance to really work with these people. I'd like to acknowledge Pauline and Pat Twig. Um, they are the coordinators for the, their respective tribes. So basically, Roy, their chief, was going to be the elder to come. I'm, I'm the backup plan. <laughs> so I wanted to quote him here. He said, to all combine our efforts, community support, language nests, etc., must coincide with combined effort, peer men mentorship, personal accountability, motivation. We all have to work together. It's no one man's job to save the language. And without this combined effort, basically collective, effort, um, the languages will continue to suffer. I'm um, Delia Twig. Basically, I am an independent now since I haven't been on the board. I've kind of just felt that my work had not been done yet, so I, I do conduct um, workshops. I do a lot of presentations. Basically, I really, my passion is with the language, and basically, as an elder, and I know a person really not the elder, but you know, for a lack of a better word, in Blackfoot, that's 
who I am, Dawaskako. Mm -hmm. I am a grandparent, mm -hmm. and I do hold um, some ceremonial knowledge that we have passed down because I am a, a member, mm -hmm. an elder for a society. So I am a knowledge holder too. So, but for me, it's very personal because what I know and the teachings that I've received through the sacred society of uh, the Horn Society, I, ha I received them in Blackfoot, okay? And they have really deep meaning. Some things you just can't seem to translate into English and have the same meaning. So for me, it's really personal that my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren know the language so that we can continue passing the language on as it was meant to be. So for me, I create awareness and education about the impact of colonialism, exploring and trying to understand the two worlds that our children are, are kind of caught in, and basically all of us who are uh, schooled through the boarding school. Our children need a complete education curriculum. The Western curriculum covers the Western world, but we need to educate our children in our world. Okay, so some of the basic terms, worldview. What is our basic truth? Okay, as indigenous people, we have our own truths, our own worldview, and inherent, meaning it's existing in someone or something as a permanent and inseparable element, quality or attribute, means you can never escape the color of your skin. Okay, and that's something that assimilation with government policy tried to do. They forgot that they cannot whitewash us. This is inherent. We are born into this. And no assimilation policy from the government is ever going to wipe that out. And that is kind of where I create the awareness when people are vulnerable because they are native. I try and give them some history about why they are so vulnerable, that it's not their fault, but it's government policy. It's those assimilation policies that forgot that they could not give us white skin, okay? We still have to always answer for the color of our skin. And also, with, in talking about the two world concept, the indigenous world and the western world, creating an ethical space for our children, because those worlds clash. They do. You cannot, but neither of them are going anywhere either. I always use this example just so we can understand. Uh, maybe I'll just wait till the next. And time immemorial, that we, our time goes way back before recorded history from 1492. Ours goes way back. Time immemorial, that is us. It's time, unrecorded time. We've been here a long time. And that is inherent, that's Canada's inherent. Uh, identity, basically. So here's the two worlds here. For the longest time, the Western world had overshadowed our indigenous world. Okay, That's where all our ed education was concentrated on that Western world and totally forgot about our indigenous world. So what I'm calling this, what we're going through, every conference we're learning together, all of us today we're learning, is that we are just waking. Somebody talked about our languages just waking, wake, waking up our languages. Well, I, I kind of equated it to um, an enlightenment for us, because now we're finally reclaiming who we are, our inherent identity. A lot of us are just learning about who we are. I didn't start knowing who I really was till I was in my 30s. That was half my life. Well, yeah. no, half my life. <laughs> um, I can't lie about my age. My hair gives it away. No. So it was my inherent identity that I did not know and made me very vulnerable. 
and I, our children really need to start, we really need to educate our children in that indigenous world, and language is a big part of that. Language is attached to the land that we're in. We, we are our traditional territories. Everything has to do with that. But our children, though, today, they have to walk in both worlds. So we have to somehow create this ethical space. Um, I'm kind of talking about Ermine, you know, Willie Ermine. He talks about ethical space, a space where we can coexist, that our children do not have to give up being indigenous like we've had to through boarding school, but yet still know the Western ways, because basically that's where we go and we work, right? So our children work, walk in both worlds, but we have to make sure that we do educate them in that indigenous world where McDonald said to take the children away from their savage environment. Remember, that was the savage environment. So, so we have to get away from that. We have to learn how to move away from that. Um, how would you say that thinking that has been kind of um, uh, embedded in our minds through um, boarding school. We are a distinct people. Six grades to be, there's four tribes there. We share a language. Our governance and culture is the same. We share a traditional territory and uh, membership. Okay. So basically, just quickly going through some of the things that we have been working on, language, we have to make sure that we keep on top of what percentage are speaking. Are we actually making progress in increasing the percentage? We have to monitor those things because we cannot have our head in the sand and think that you know everything is okay. We can't do that anymore. So, and for us, Ghana, well, six gates to be, the language is really alive in the societies. Okay, our, our ceremonies require the, our language. It, in there, it's everybody's responsibility to learn the language. Okay, and then now, trying to see what TRC and UNDRIP and provincial, provincial, provincial curriculum, how they're going to help out with um, saving our language. We have to um, create um, capacity, uh, find, um, trying to make long-term plans years into the future, how our language is going to survive how those people 50 years into the future are gonna still keep s speaking the language. I'm just gonna quickly go through this. Okay, so cultures, yeah, society protocols. With societies, they have to learn the language. They can't, um, they have to survive that society. And so therefore, that's the perfect immersion, basically setting, okay. Um, with, um, with the schools, I was going to let Pat talk here, but I'm running out of time here. So, but we've really kind of gone through a lot of conversation, and we've included the whole community, the levels of uh, power, if you want to say, all levels, our, our political, our program people, our community, our speakers, and we've got enrichment program, we're working on fast track, learning, um, still talking about adult immersion programs because we have a lot of our speaker, our people that still think the language and understand the language, but they can't speak it. So therefore, immersion program, adult immersion programs are really needed again, as Bruce said, we need the money to do that. So, um, yeah, so basically, I think we're all kind of trying to do the same thing. Um, 
Again, capacity building. Bruce talked about we need to learn, we need to read and write. There's not enough people that read and write the program, um, the language in the future. One morning, I have a little toddler at home. I speak to him, Blackfoot, all morning long. But one day, I heard the TV and I knew it was a native language, and I went in, and here it was Cree, you know, animation, a TV, almost like um, Sesame Street, you know, but it was in Cree, and I thought, hey, how come, you know, what about Six Gates to be, what about the Blackfoot language, how could we have something like that? You know, I imagine they must have got dollars from someplace, but this is what I'm saying, we need that. A lot of training, teaching our future teachers and, and our children. Again, like Bruce said, we need long-term plans, basically, for our languages to six, uh, to keep going. Okay, thank you. It's near Nagu Nichi Snadan Kudab Nichi Omine Nagu Yahigaki Agatna Ko Winja in Kumiji. She winja in Kuminchawa. Hiktam in Hubide, which are now Hiktam in Hubide. Get Hubni Hejabi, Ungun Chayami, Abdun Chayami. Nagu Tumaxi Dun Chayami, Kungsi Dun Chayami. Iski abidne the home of Tangas in Higi Jab de Chach. In no high Iski abidne, I am no stomach. O Spain Chichiam in Jar Iski abidne, do any abide snow yagabitas, do any abihina Iskabi hidden chabine, O in a chief no skimitas, Dan in china big tats, Ninchi parmising tats, Negijao chawan, Hechana jeons, Yeska wok jamine, Yeska tor hangede, Ayah no stomach, Eabe, I stomach tawan, Tanoskan tawachi. We tore hung in it. Nangu, Tanoskan, Oyadine. Yako, Ohan Yad in Chiabik. Do any abide, an inchif no stomach touch. In Egidia, Wahogo in Chiabit Shower. Hechana, Nangu, Yescabi, Hang a chabine. Yescangi abine, Nahnish, if no habit shower. Kokto bore sharpe a gazata when you said to be a what a nishni and come in. Say Kokto bore to sa a gazata nahnish yeska ingi abichawa. Hechana yeska ingi abine nahnish no dabichas. Ne yahaki gahna in comine yeska ingi abine. Hechana Jeons Nangu Dacha Wahugon Kiapnish I Abile Ne Dacha Wahunja in Abneko Dago was never coaching in Nario Kans in Egidia when the Hiam in Tower Hechana Nario Kanze Nangu I Abinish Nario Kans Abitus. Hechana Zen Ario Kazos Dagoas, the Mancochinet. 
na guchengia bineko seo na chegia ambangina abihna na gu dacha nema kochine dacha wa chin chaina mene tunga sibin inkusibin na gu ham nebinej seo na chim chagia inkumin chawat je na yo khats i abine ngegi jao jong Nangu win choi is das in das kam na handa win choi e in ginabi ne in wiyami na ne doken ngiabite sno ngiab chawan nangu win chabi na is doken in abite je is om chabia om chawan hechen win chai abina na wiyami na ne is wiya in abichawat hetin na gu wiya bi ngogi chichia bichas wiya ngogi chichia ya buwan im se pasit ya hihini ambas tech we wezde ngina buwan im wiya ngogi chichia bi na gu win chabis win chabi yena hogi chichia ya bis win chabi nes is kun chogi chichia chawat o minsin ya hihinu egi chigia chawat doke hia ufumo zewe choi zina bwat hetsen is kengi abne ino dabuan hetsia dacha uni stugadam nechi manini kumina nangu in kumina dugas dacha Uzi punya chawat. Yeske abi ngahnustamik tam zeis ngoki ab chawan githabni hetabi. Hetagiya donam bad na yami zeis no yami chas. Hetya na yami bis awak ta ingi chya bis indena uze. Awak ho ingi chumi indena uze is ho ingi na abi chas. Hetya na aping ingi chya abi na yami bis. Is king yamne, oweying each yabit, yabit. Nangu ne oahan oahan kabi, pinchin, ochna, inko, ingina, duan, nangu ne oweyne is yawene. Setakun yinabna, setu up him each yabit. Amos tits. Amawa Tets is a greeting that we use in our culture. When we see each other, you know, if we haven't seen each other for a week, a couple of days, in our culture, in our Nakoda culture, when we see each other, we'll say, Amawa Tets. And we'll go like this, Amawa Tets. Amawa Tets is, means or it's making reference to the day, that today is a beautiful day. And every day in our culture, it's a beautiful day. It also reminds us that in our culture, our language has a spirit, and that we have that sacred connection to the environment to the day, and we acknowledge that, and we, through our saying, encompasses everything that we believe in, that holistic perspective. No, Ambalatich has a more deeper meaning, connects us to our spiritual practices and our beliefs. So every day in our culture is a beautiful day. And with that, I want to greet all of you. It's a real honor. No, this is the first time that Treaty 7 speakers have gotten together and sat on a panel like this. We talk about the importance of language in our Nakoda culture, 
No, I come from a community of the Wasijus, the Tunuskan, they call it Mori. Our Yista Nakoda people, no, we call it Minitni. And it's making reference to, once again, to the environment, the Bow River that flows through our territory. And that's some people call that Morley in our culture. We call it Minisni. And that's our winter campground that the reservation system was imposed at the time of treaties. Iyitha in our culture is in interpreted as Iyista, meaning that those that speak the pure language. And that's what our relatives referred to us as Iyista people. And that's making, putting the references on the language. And that's how we identify ourselves as Iyista Nakoda people from the mountains. Now, in our culture, our parents, our grandparents, used to remind us of the importance of our culture, our language, and how sacred our language is, because our language has a spirit. And that spirit is so sacred, because it was through our language that we connected as an individual. We connected ourselves to everything around us. We connected ourselves to the universe, to the stars. We connected ourselves to the rivers, the rocks, the lakes the mountains, the spirit beings around us. And it was through our language that we could do that. No, we could pray in our languages. And that gave us so much strength. It energized us because we could connect through our language. Our language in our culture is very sacred in every culture. And we're told that and we're reminded as children how sacred our language is. And those are the teachings, no storytelling. Our Yiska language is a very descriptive language. No, the storytelling, no, was one way that we, as children growing up, were taught about morals, values, what was right, what was wrong, and so forth. And that was through storytelling. Through storytelling, we were able to preserve our language. And also, it was through storytelling that we were able to learn, to learn about our culture, to learn about our history. And also, we were always told that to take pride in your language, in your culture, in your history. No, we talked about decolonization a lot on how we need to be colonized. And yet, if we look at ourselves, we're all sitting here. No, our, we're losing our languages really fast. And our people are very progressive as well. But at the same time, we were very resilient, very stable. 
We were very balanced people. And that's what we need to retain and teach our children that we are resilient people and that we need to keep that holistic connection to the environment you know, through ceremony and that language is that tool and that vehicle that will take us through our journey. And with that, I want to thank each and every one of you. Isnias. So we have a little bit of time left over for questions for our panel. So if anyone has a question. We're Dene. Good day. You should have come to the conference. You would have learned lots. <laughs> Where are you from? Right now, I'm from Kaisenach, north of here. Oh, yeah. But I live in Winnipeg now. Oh, yeah. No, it was a good conference. We had about, I don't know, maybe 30 groups, eh, John? Uh, we had Apaches, Navajo, we had them there, and, uh, but we didn't get any from California. Too much fire, I guess. But we're the, uh, when we migrated, the first people we ran into were the Bloods. And we fought them all day, and they withdrew. And then we, we called them the real Blackfoot because their territory was right up to Fort Vermilion before the, you know, before the priest drove them south. Well, that's a quick history of our, of our people. His brother Alex told me that uh, oh, and he came from the South of people. Yeah, that's what we call ourselves. From the Grand Prairie area, that's where we've migrated. The, uh, the well, the Beaver people at Satine, all that from that river must be right to the BC boundary. Anyways, uh, in, uh, just like Bruce, he wanted to be a pope, but decided to be a linguist. And anyways, I wanted to be a lawyer, basically because Harry Mason always won his cases. And I didn't want to be an Indian because the Indians lost the wars when Johnny Wayne was there, so I became a cowboy, rodeoed, and got hurt, and now I'm suffering for it. Anyways, going back to very little knowledge about my uh, Blackfoot ways of, Blackfoot ways of knowing. So, in the teachings that Delia has made, uh, talked about, and going into the Southern Society, I started to learn who I was. Yeah. Now, as an educator, when I first started teaching in uh, grade seven and eight, there was no material 
that was available and not knowing how to write the language and not being a linguist, I had to produce my own stuff. And I think most, most language teachers go through the same process. But right, and also when I started becoming the language coordinator, I was operating on a shoestring budget. Couldn't really produce or develop any resources. But now, and the language program in the school, secondary from K to 12, it was, we had to follow the Alberta curriculum in their language. Uh, and so, which also make it, made it difficult because we didn't get any funding from the province. Anyways, that's another story. But right now, what we're doing, uh, based on what we have learned and what the teachings of Delia and others, we are developing what we call uh, land-based learning. And through the land-based learning, we have the stories that cover Blackfoot territory. And in these Blackfoot stories, there are sites that have stories in there. You take a look at the rock in Okotoks. Take a look at around Cayley, Alberta, the women's buffalo jump. Look at over at Majorville, where the coming of the women's holy lodge, the story coming from there. Also, looking at Medicine Act. So, um, there is a story, and if you Google it, you'll see the headdress in uh, Medicine Hat, the story behind that. So what we're doing is, when you're looking at how we learned and didn't like our, our didn't relate to ourselves as the Tzita, as being First Nations or using these uh, Caucasian terms and uh, policy terms, which I don't really like, but anyways, to doing that paradigm shift. Okay, we learned this through movies, through reading, through uh, technology. Why don't we use those same things to teach our children uh, our, that way? So what we're developing is animating these stories in Blackfoot, also with uh, uh, captions on them in Blackfoot. Example, I hired an IT person that didn't know any Blackfoot. He came from uh, Bikani. He was spent all day recording and editing all the Blackfoot elders that came to, to be recorded. Within one year, he started talking Blackfoot. So that technology also will help. In when uh, the NDP, NDP government took office in Alberta, they really supportive of the First Nations language and everything. So they developed, they made a policy to do redesign of the, uh, redesign the curriculum, in the, uh, uh, which would put in First Nations and Indigenous language and culture into the curriculum. So we got started on that, and all, then they lost seat. Now, the new UCP government is putting that on hold, but we're continuing on to develop those resources. What uh, Sakagi talked about, our little guy watching those cartoons. He said, hey, that's, a, that's what we're pushing for, that we can have those on DVD, and online so our kids can learn the language. When I first started, I did, took a survey, 83% of our students understand our language, but they can't speak. So through this process, we're hoping that they can start talking. Uh, and the biggest thing, to, in order to know your culture, your ways of knowing, is through language. If you don't know that, there's, um, um, uh, won't be afraid to say, say this, our ceremonies are lost. 
that we lose our language. So we are making every effort to, to bring these into, into uh, forward, so that way stories that Bruce tell about the Blackfoot, our, our, our students will think, gee, Bruce is lying. No, just kidding. <laughs> We felt pity for them, so we told them, live by the Elbow River. Thank you for your attention. Yeah. So, one more thing from Bruce, and then thank you for all that. Just one more quick comment. As teachers, we're not being held accountable because there's no benchmarks for learning. We need to be held accountable. We need to create those benchmarks that uh, that actually the learner is is learning. Um, one of the things that I would also like to mention is that each and every one of you that are sitting in this room and out there, we all have a responsibility. Each and every one of us, we need to go home. We need to talk to our grandchildren, our children, in our language so that we can preserve our language. And that we need to inform our children that language is sacred, that we need to inform them that it is through that their language that they can instill and have a positive sense of identity of who they are. Yes.